The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thanks very much. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pre essentially presenting this presentation on behalf of uh, Professor Riyadh, who couldn't make it here today. So, essentially, uh, recently we've, we've commissioned a multi-axis substructure testing system at Swinburne University of Technology. And it's considered to be the most advanced and versatile system for large-scale testing of structures. Now, what you can see in the photo here is four one meganewton actuators supporting a um, nine and a half ton cruciform. In addition to that, we have two 500 kilonewton actuators in orthogonal directions, which are connected, connected um, from the cruciform into, your, into the reaction walls. Now, the support system of this mast system actually consists of a five meter high uh, by one meter thick reaction wall and a one meter thick strong floor. And the, the size of the specimens that we can actually test within this um, system here is, is approximately three meters cubed. So you can see the following two figures show the orientation of the actuators a little more clearly. You can see the four one meganewton actuators um, supporting the cruciform here. You can see the specimen in the middle. Now the specimen is usually fastened to the base of the strong floor as well as it's fixed to the top of the cruciform, which is known as the control point. And at this control point, we can apply six DOF, or six degree of freedom uh, displacements and forces. And um, so the total amount of vertical force is, is four meganewton, um, and we can apply one meganewton horizontal forces in each direction. And I have a short video here which just give you an idea of the type of, of movements um, once the system is up and running. So this is the side sway movement in each direction. And then we, we have uh, up and down movement plus or minus 250 mil in the, in the Z direction as well as we can apply rotations about all three axes. So one of the first experimental models that we actually used to commission this facility um, was a column extracted from a five-story building. Now this is actually a corner column in a five-story building. And the corner, corner column was chosen because it was considered to be the critical element where, in the case of an earthquake, uh, loading condition. And it's a critical element because as the, as the building starts to fail and you end up with rotation, your corner columns generally pick up a lot of your axial load variations and they can be most susceptible for failure prior to the others. So the column that you're seeing here is actually half scale, so it's 250 by 250 millimeters in cross section. It's reinforced with four N16 diameter reinforcement bars, as well as R6 ligatures at 175 millimeter spacing. We have 400 millimeter sections at the top and bottom of the column simply to tie the, the column to the cruciform as well as to the strong base of the strong floor. Now this column was subjected to two types of loading condition. The first was a quasi-static loading condition and the second was a hybrid loading condition, which I'll explain a little later. But essentially the quasi-static loading condition consisted of a constant axial load which was applied to the column equivalent to about 8% of the compressive strength, stress, strength of the column. Um, in addition to that, a hexagonal uh, drift pattern was, was applied to the column um, and, and drift was imposed in one direction that was as twice the other direction. So this was to simulate um, you know, when, when the structure is subjected to an earthquake loading condition, you generally get drift uh, predominantly occurring um, towards one side as, as the building starts to rotate. 
Uh, so these are the results from the quasi-static loading cycle. This is the hysteretic response. So you can see that um, the shear force, we achieved approximately 40 kilonewtons at about 4% drift in the X direction and about 50 to, to 60 kilonewtons um, for about 4 to 8% drift in the Y direction. Now all of this was, was uh, using a constant axial load response which you can see at the, the bottom curve here, so the axial load was constant. So the second type of uh, loading configuration we used was hybrid simulation. So with hybrid simulation, the way it works is that we have the entire building modeled numerically. Um, we then have a component of that, of that uh, building that we, we build, we, we test in the lab, and through the numerical simulation, we actually impose several uh, ground motion sh scenarios. And from the numerical model, we get the appropriate uh, displacements and forces that are, that are to be applied at that uh, particular structural element at the control point. And those forces and displacement are fed into the actuators in the physical test. Those actuators impose displacements to the physical specimens. As a result of those displacements, we end up with getting uh, force readouts from the actuators which in turn get fed back into the numerical model which modifies the stiffness of, the, of that particular structural element and it recalculates a set of uh, force and displacement conditions to be reapplied to the physical test. So it's essentially a, a feedback loop and communication between a numerical model and a physical test um, through progressive um, ground motion cycles until failure. So as you can see, this is a half-scale uh, mock-up of a five-story building. The physical specimens served as the first first-story corner column, and that was considered as the critical element of the structure. And the rest of the structural elements, such as inertia, damping forces, gravity, and dynamic loads, and second-order effects were modeled numerically in the computer. So the following just sort of explains a little bit in more detail some of the controls that were used in order to impose a hybrid loading condition. And the scale factors of 0 0.6, 4, 8 and 9 were used on, on the uh, ground motions. And the following results were achieved. So you can see in contrast to the uh, non-hybrid uh, loading condition that the, the, the drift is actually asymmetric. Before we were, when looking at this pseudo-static um, loading condition, we end up with a very symmetrical uh, drift, whereas when we're looking at hybrid simulation, we end up with asymmetric drift. And this is because when looking at, at buildings which have been tested on a shake table, um, generally you end up with a phenomenon called ratcheting, which, which happens as a result of the building tilting towards one side. So you, you end up getting drift which is asymmetric. You end up with drift um, leaning towards one side, which you can see clearly here in the hybrid uh, model, but it wouldn't be accounted for um, when testing using non-hybrid techniques. The other thing that you, you can see here is a lot of axial load variation, which you can pick up using hybrid simulation, but what, you'll completely miss that without using hybrid simulation. So in terms of comparing quasi-static and hybrid simulation results in terms of the damage, what you can see here is that using a quasi-static testing procedure, it actually resulted in significantly more damage uh, to the column. As you can see, the deformations are much more severe. The much more concrete is spoiled, both from the top and the bottom of the column. And the reinforcement bars have deformed uh, more significantly in the quasi-static test as opposed to the hybrid test. So essentially, the quasi-static test is providing um, a much more conservative uh, prediction of, of the structural response, as well as overestimating the degree of damage. Now the following curve compares the shear versus drift ratios between the quasi-static test and the hybrid test. So as you can see, the hybrid uh, testing configuration actually resulted in a higher load prediction, 65 kilonewtons, as opposed to 56 kilonewtons for the quasi-static test. So the hybrid is providing a much more realistic uh, prediction of performance here. Another curve that you can see here is a, is a probabilistic analysis, which is 
essentially plotting um, logarithmic curves correlating the probability of collapse with the ground motion intensity. And you can see the black curve is the, the hybrid simulation test, which is actually providing um, a much higher probability of collapse than the quasi-static test, so 75% as opposed to 50%. So there's clearly a difference here, and hybrid is obviously providing the most um, accurate probability of collapse here as well. So after the, this particular specimen was damaged, the next uh, step was to repair the column. So the repair procedure consisted of initially removing all of the fractured concrete uh, from the column, injecting any cracks greater than 0.3 millimeters in width, and then reinstating the damaged concrete with a suitable repair mortar. And lastly, we wrapped the column with three layers of CFRP in order to confine the column at, at both at the top and bottom of the, of the specimen. The, the hybrid test was rerun using exactly, exactly the same load protocols as for the undamaged specimen, and the following results were achieved. So you can see the difference here between the initial and repaired hysteretic response. So we didn't quite reinstate the original moment carrying capacity um, of the column. It reduced from somewhere in the order of 60 kilonewtons to around 40 kilonewtons. Um, and this is because we didn't actually reinstate the steel reinforcement, which has yielded the flexural steel reinforcement. However, we, we achieved fairly good, even better levels of ductility than the uh, initial column. So this is showing a bit of a close-up view here. So the difference in terms of, of uh, shear capacity between the two columns was 65 kilonewtons for the undamaged column and then 44 kilonewtons for the repaired. However, for, for the repaired, you can see that we had a, a, a very good level of ductility and even better ductility performance than, than the initial column. And this was the result of the confinement provided by the FRP. Again, when looking at the probability of collapse, they're fairly close. I mean, the repaired column wasn't quite as, as good as the, the initial column, but essentially the probability of collapse was, wasn't, wasn't too different. Okay, with that, I'd like to conclude and open for any questions. Thanks. Any questions for Robin? I have one. In your uh, report, it was quite interesting to see that the shear degradation in DX, almost you didn't have any shear degradation, but in the Y direction, you had significant shear degradation. I would, not, I would expect maybe that to be true, but no, different. You know, if you look at, so it seems like the, uh, towards the uh, minus, three, yeah. that's towards the later cycle. Yeah. The other one, so the degradation seems to be, especially in the repairs. Yeah. I, I would say that because the, the maximum drift was actually imposed in the Y direction, so the steel reinforcement would have yielded in the Y direction much more significantly than, say, in the X direction. So I think that, that may explain that because in the Y direction where we had drift in the Y, in the X direction, sorry, the steel reinforcement was, was still largely contributing to the flexural strength. Yeah, but you have basically rotation about an axis, so the, the yielding of the reinforcement might occur towards the corners. So I would expect maybe some of the Yeah. Yep. I think it's a log normal fit. Yeah. So uh, you've reviewed a lot of the literature based on that first presentation, which, mm -hmm. by the way, was based on a report compiled for 447. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a, a question for the experimentalists out there. What data do you think is generally missing or not that well reported for numerical modelers? In terms of, you mean data for... Like, data from, from tests from experiments? That we need yeah. to conduct good, robust modelling. 
Yeah, I think one of the missing things is of, often stra- like looking at focusing on strengthening of using FRPs. Is it's often the strain in the carbon fibres not being reported, fortunately, and a lot of the time, you know, people do a, a test and they say, okay, this is the load of the unstrengthened beam, and this is the load of the strengthened beam, and we increase the strength by 20% or 50% without actually reporting the strain in the carbon fibre. And without the strain in the carbon fibre, we can't actually assess how much more efficient, you know, that particular strengthening technique was and perhaps correlate that with some, some numerical model, some design guideline or use it to develop some design guideline. So, so yeah, I think the strain in the FRP is, is something that I've sort of found to be missing a lot of the time. Take heed of that, please. <laughs> Um, personally, I wasn't too involved with the hybrid aspects. I did a little bit of work on the strengthening side, um, so I'm not too sure, to be honest, but you can definitely ask... ask uh, the, question, the reason why I ask yep. the question is because the columns do have torsion. What model, you probably don't know, what model did you use? Did you use a fiber model like open seas? Or we used open seas. Yeah, you see, if you use open seas, you don't have the normal interactions to, to aggregate the sections. Yep. So your movement in the torsion component is constant. So you don't have really that torsion degradation in open seas. Mm-hmm. So the elements that you model will not capture that, but your test will capture that degradation. Mm-hmm. So you could have the ratchet effect probably more accentuated or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've done some hybrid simulation. It's quite significant that the torsion degradation that we saw on the test was not the same as what we did on the columns that we had, similar because we were using okay. open seas. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, um, yeah, I think I'll raise that issue with, with um, some of the guys. Okay, if there's no more questions, we'll call this to a close. Thank you. All right, very much. thanks.